So thank you, Elmer, for that warm introduction. And a very good afternoon to all of you. It's a great pleasure to be present here to share my views and experiences on the Ayurvedic perspective on vegetarian nutrition. So I have basically just two things to say today afternoon, giving due consideration to the limited time that is available. And one is that yesterday we had this very interesting veg quiz and in which uh, I was surprised, it was new knowledge to me also, that it's officially acknowledged that vegetarianism originated in India. And actually, one part of my presentation would unravel the story of how vegetarianism originated in India. And I'd like to uh, point out that India was never always vegetarian, and there's a, a story behind this evolution. The second part of my talk would be trying to define how Ayurveda looks at vegetarian diet and looking at how Ayurveda talks about balanced diet, how we could take a call on what is today. You know, you have so many uh, stratified classifications of diet from the vegan to, you know, flexi vegetarian and what would be Ayurveda's uh, take on this. So there are just two things I want to say uh, and I'll go on to the first point is that if you are going to look at India as the land in which our vegetarianism originated, we have some remnants of that you know, origin. Even today, one third of the population of India is vegetarian. It doesn't really look so impressive when you think of India as a land of vegetarianism, but if you compare it with the rest of the world, then it does make a big difference. Like in India, uh, the meat consumption is just 4.4 kg per person which is 116 kilograms less than what is consumed in the United States. And if you look at the other countries, Australia, New Zealand, Austria, Italy, Germany, the United Kingdom, Russia, and the list goes on. I mean, India still seems to be a stronghold for vegetarian diet. And uh, it's interesting to look at uh, what Ayurveda has to say because the healthcare practices in India was predominantly influenced by Ayurveda because it has been the indigenous system of healthcare. And in the next few minutes, I'd like to unravel what would perhaps be the story of the origin of vegetarianism in India. So Ayurveda has been a witness to evolution of dietary practices in India. You know, Ayurveda has a, uh, a a long, continuous, unbroken tradition of at least 3,000 years, maybe even more, we do not know. And things have not been the same. You know, this is more than two millennia, and people have changed their diet habits, they've experimented with life, societies have changed radically, and Ayurveda has also not remained the same. And if you look at classical Ayurvedic texts, we do find that Ayurveda has faithfully documented the changes that happened, especially in the South Asian region. But there are also references to other parts of the world like Greece and China. So Ayurveda physicians were looking at what was happening around the then known world. And what I want to say is that if Vegetarianism became established at one point in the history of Ayurveda. It has been a result of an evolution from a more non-vegetarian oriented diet to something which was more vegetarian. And uh, I think we are going to relive, we are reliving this process today, what happened in India many centuries ago. And uh, there are many factors that played a role in this transition from uh, uh, I would say Ayurveda was from the beginning a mixed diet approach, which gradually around the middle ages, you know, really got consolidated into a full-fledged vegetarian system with even textbooks being reframed in, 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 uh, with this vegetarian outlook. And many factors have contributed to the development of vegetarianism in India. And one is, of course, Ayurveda kept recording the medicine properties of all substances that could be listed on earth. Because one of the dictums of Ayurveda is everything under the sun has some value, medicinal value, nutritional value. So they kept recording. If somebody was using something, then it would get listed in some lexicon at some period of time, and they would write, this is, this is the good and bad about that thing. And so over a period of time, a large volume of information 
uh, was accumulated on the properties, nutritional properties of plant sources. And this helped when there was a big uh, crisis in thinking, uh, especially the uh, religion played a very big role in the shift from non-vegetarian to vegetarian diet, because many of these earlier religious practices involved the killing of animals as for ritual purposes. And there was a big revolt against this at one point of time. And the concept of ahimsa, which became so powerful in the Indian uh, thought process, uh, and also the awakening of spiritual you know, compassion. These were, I think, the three major forces that led to the transition from a non-vegetarian to a vegetarian diet. And Ayurveda's role there was to show how rich the plant wealth of the earth is. Because one of the texts like the Sushruta Samhita says that you must search for natural resources everywhere, uh, not only on mountains, in, under the sea, on land, the earth is bountiful. So there's so much of rich resources available that it became so evident that it's possible to discover a non-violent way of sustaining ourselves. So if you look at these uh, developments in the backdrop of these sociological, philosophical, epistemological, spiritual trends, Ayurveda offered an alternative. And this is the situation in which the Ayurvedic vegetarian diet evolved. And there was these interesting philosophical debates as to can violence be completely avoided in human life? So there was this distinction between legitimate violence and illegitimate violence, a very interesting concept, dharma himsa and kama himsa. Because I think uh, things were debated to the extremes, like we had Jainists who said that even breathing can kill other life forms. And so they, it was difficult to even live without harming others. And Ayurveda was one of the earliest systems to be aware of the microbiome. In the Charaka Samhita, we talk about Sahaja Krimis, that we live with Krimis of microorganisms, and that many of them are Sahaja, or not harmful, that we coexist with them. And they were aware that our even small actions can actually either harm them or sustain them. So to this minute level, they thought about violence. There were arguments that, you know, there's a famous Sanskrit statement that life is food for life. It's talking about the web of life and the food chain and that it's inevitable that we inflict some harm in the process of sustaining ourselves. It's not possible to live a completely non-violent life. And the whole thing was that you needed to justify, you needed to do, good more, do more good than the harm that you do. And that's the way you can justify your existence on this earth. So minimize harm. So it then boiled down to that concept. And that's what is called as dharma himsa. And that was a very central concept. Ayurvedic textbooks talk about it, especially the later texts, when they justify why in certain diseases we may have to recommend non-vegetarian food. Or from a nutritional viewpoint, sometimes we may have to accept it. And then it is accepted as Dharma Himsa. And then there, you can see in India was perhaps the earliest, uh, you know, a ban on animal slaughter. And this is a very interesting extract from an edict of King Ashoka, where he says, I'll not read all of it, but he says that, you know, formerly in the kitchen, his kitchen, his own kitchen, hundreds of thousands of animals were killed every day to make curry. So this was prevalent in India at one point of time. But now with the writing of this Dharma edict, only three creatures, two peacocks, and a deer are killed, and, not, and the deer not always. And in time, not even these creatures will be killed. And around this time, there was also the first, I think this is the first book on descriptive zoology in the world. Uh, a king went for a hunting expedition, and he became so remorseful when he saw that so many animals were killed. He was suddenly stuck by the diversity of animal life. And then he commissioned one of his uh, courtiers to write a textbook on Mirga Pakshi Shastra, which describes the beauty of animal life and the need to protect animal life and the need to discover a non-violent way of you know, uh, providing nutrition to oneself. And there are also religious injections against meat eating right from the beginning. 
like you know the deer, camel, donkey, monkey, rats, all these are to be considered as one's own children and we cannot differentiate between one's children and these creatures and that if you kill these harmful creatures then you know you will never get true happiness either in this or the other life. So these were things that were shaping and it even reached a point where Ayurveda was also criticized. Ayurveda faced a severe criticism in one stage of its evolution that it is recommending a lot of non-vegetarian diet. Everything in the world, because Ayurveda just documents, okay, dogs, meat, yes, it has got this property, this is good, this is bad. Snake, everything is described, but it's described just to explain what they are. It's just a natural description. So there was a saying that the medical science would describe so many things, but all of them are never applied. So you're not going to kill and eat lions, but lion's meat is also described in Ayurveda. So, uh, so at that point of time, it was also said that dog's meat described in Ayurvedic texts is not fit for human consumption, but we know that even dogs are eaten today. Uh, it, it was estimated in 2014 that 25 million dogs are eaten each year by humans and these are some of the countries in which this practice is still there. And in Ayurveda, we find Ayurveda was just like this, that any human dietary practice would get documented and it would be assessed for its pros and cons. So now I come to the second part of my talk, like Ayurveda changed from a non-vegetarian to a vegetarian diet over a period of time. But how do we look at how Ayurveda defines uh, vegetarianism. So I'd like to quote Jolinda Hackett, she's a nutritionist. People often point to some food item and ask me, can you eat this? And my answer is always, sure, I can eat whatever I want. I choose not to eat certain things when deciding what type of which kind of vegetarian you want to be. Think about what you want to include or why. You don't need to fit into one of these categories. But understanding them will help you think about your short-term and long-term goals. When Ayurveda doesn't create these categories of vegetarian or non-vegetarian diet, but rather it gives you certain thumb rules, which is what I want to discuss, on discovering a balanced nutrition, which is, involves minimal harm on other living forms and the environment, but also fulfills the nutritional requirements of human beings. So, in the ninth century, finally, we have a really vegan textbook on Ayurveda, which removed all references to the non-vegetarian diet. So uh, it's quite evident from the classical text that vegetarianism was discovered by hindsight. In the Charaka Samhita, there is a reference that sages say that the food of the civilized world is the root cause of all diseases, and we have to shift to a simple vegetarian diet. And there are sporadic references in later texts that you have to be completely abstaining from meat and alcohol to have good physical and mental health. So around the 15th century, Ayurveda also shifted from pharmacological therapeutics to nutritional therapeutics. And it was at this time that famous statements began to come uh, that, you know, if diet and lifestyle are regulated, what is the use of medicine? And if diet and lifestyle are not regulated, then also what is the use of medicine? So this was a time when Ayurveda began to discover that diet and lifestyle alone can help to, you know, deal with a lot of diseases. So now I would like to point out, this is also a challenge and difficulty today, that vegetarianism cannot be, or it's not just about discarding all animal sources of food. I mean, just by shifting to vegetarianism, you cannot solve all your health problems. In fact, Ayurveda says that you need to be very careful on the way you plan your vegetarian diet. Otherwise, you are just moving from the fire, I mean, from the frying pan into the fire. And of course, being a medical system, Ayurveda is also not just concerned about the ahimsa, it wants to meet both goals that we should do less harm, but also fulfill the nutritional requirements. So Ayurveda proposes that, you know, one of the key aspects of Ayurveda is person-centered approach, that the diet will be very specific for each individual. And so we cannot really generalize this, this type of diet is always better in terms of another diet. 
And dietary requirements change according to the place, according to the time, according to the condition of the individual. And so you can only give some thumb rules on the basis of which you can keep dynamically assessing your nutritional requirements and make these micro adjustments. That's where Ayurveda left things. So I'll get into it. Uh, so you have some of these classifications that we have today are the raw vegan, the vegan, ovo-lacto-vegetarian, pescetarian, macrobiotic, flexi-vegetarian, uh, and Ayurveda, it's very difficult to characterize Ayurvedic approach with any of these classifications. We can only say that it definitely prefers vegetarianism, but it not, does not focus on any of these specific approaches. So what does it do? What Ayurveda says is that there are about eight factors that you need to consider to plan a balanced diet, to discover a balanced vegetarian diet. And this is the nature of the food, the combination of the foods. Like specific foods are relevant for specific contexts and specific people. Some foods are beneficial when you combine them. The way you process the food also alters their properties. So, if you want to develop a vegetarian diet, you need to really plan your diet looking into these factors. The quantity of the food is also another factor that determines whether it would be good or bad. The place where you live, certain foods may be suitable and certain not. The seasons, what is good in summer may not be good in winter. So Ayurveda has a lot of observations on these variabilities. And then there are rules of dietetics, like how you space your meals, how you combine. And then finally, personalization, which is based on cons constitution and other factors. Unfortunately, we do not have many studies you know, that have looked into Ayurveda from this perspective. But I will just give some findings, some corroborations from modern scientific studies that lend support to what has been described in the Ayurvedic texts. So this is just a repetition of what I said. So specific sources of food, like you know, in Ayurveda, a special type of rice has been preferred over others for its anti-inflammatory and nutritional properties. And modern studies have shown that it has a certain component, tricin, which is having anti-inflammatory effect. So it's quite amazing that in India there were, uh, I think, uh, thousands of rice varieties, and Ayurveda picked up one of them and found it to be medicinally effective, and modern studies are actually confirming this. Then the use of millets to regulate lipid metabolism. This has also been supported by studies Gooseberry, which is said to promote longevity. It's a, it's a super fruit in Ayurveda. And just recently in India, there were some studies which showed that it can prevent DNA damage. And grapes was also considered to be the best amongst the fruits for its uh, longevity-promoting effects. And today we know that it contains resveratrol, which is found to have similar effects. And pomegranate, which is specified for cardiovascular health. So I've just picked up a few of what is described in the Ayurvedic text. And you can see these are some of the studies which have shown. This is Nyavara rice. And there is a component which gives anti-inflammatory effects. The phytochemicals in uh, sweet sorghum, which is a millet, has been shown to have effects against lipid oxidation, as mentioned in the Ayurvedic texts. So these are about gooseberry and its anti-aging effects, protection of DNA. And then in rejuvenation research, we have on resveratrol and grapes. And this is pomegranate. I'll just keep these slides. So when it comes to combination, I mean, in Indian diet, we always combine a cereal and a pulse. It's because the essential amino acids are not found in either of them. And when you combine a cereal and a pulse, so irrespective of the regions, it might be wheat or dal, or it could be rice and black gram. There's always this combination. And it recently found uh, turmeric is very widely used as a spice in Indian dishes. And it has been found that if you, only if you combine pepper with turmeric, then its bioavailability is enhanced almost by 2,000 times. And gooseberry is known to help the f absorption of iron. So all these factors, you know, were considered in planning a good diet in Ayurveda. And these are some of the studies which talk about curcumin and uh, piperin. And coriander is used, you know, to top up the Indian dishes. And today we know that it has a chemical called dodecenol, which is very powerful antibiotic. 
against salmonella. It's probably added to prevent food poisoning. And cinnamon, which is also very much used, especially in foods in which there is oil, is known to regulate lipid metabolism and prevent you know, diabetes. So when it comes to processing, there are very interesting observations in garlic should be crushed before use. And today we know the chemistry of why that should be done because unless you crush garlic, garlic the enzyme alinase converts alin into allicin, which is very unstable. So you have to just crush it just before you eat it. And this was well uh, known in Ayurveda and described in the texts. So the quantity and frequency of food items, most of the preservatives that we talk about, which are called as caustic alkalis in Ayurveda, there's a prohibition of its use. Ayurveda was against the preservation of food and always insisted on eating fresh food, so slong pepper, caustic alkalis, and salt. And then there are seasonal and regional variations. Uh, I think I will uh, come to my last point, which is the rules of dietetics. I have just one more minute. And the rules of dietetics in Ayurveda, we say, it's not just even the food that you eat, it's even the spacing between two meals makes a big difference. There was a study which showed that if you increase the fasting period between two meals, with the same diet, the outcomes are different. People who break the meals into different, uh, you know, meal times, have, uh, they have a higher BMI and higher cholesterol levels, and even their blood sugar levels remain longer at a higher level than those who have longer fasting times. And this is very much specified in Ayurveda that you should have only ideally two meals, one in the mid-morning and one in the evening, and have a long fasting period in between. So this is the paper which talks about the study. And then finally we have individualization of diet. So the last point I'd like to make is what is the current situation in India? Like we talked about Ayurveda shifting from non-vegetarian to vegetarianism and developing a kind of algorithm to decide what is a good diet without really emphasizing you know, on a particular type of vegetarianism. There are studies which show that you know, certain types of diets may have a link to insulin resistance syndrome. And on the whole, I'm not going into the details, but there are studies beginning to come up now which are looking at the kind of diets that are prevalent in India. And Initially, uh, there seems to be a trend which shows that the vegetarian diets have certain advantages. One of this here is that people with a uh, vegetarian diet have a lower uh, incidence of insulin resistance uh, and higher, uh, you know, HDL, good cholesterol profiles and uh, also correlation with diabetes. So in India, diets have changed over a period of time, especially in the last 200 years, there's been a big change. And uh, finally, I come to this point again, is that Ayurveda does not say, Ayurveda says that we have to be very careful before committing that a particular type of vegetarian diet is superior over the other. I mean, we can never say that. The vegan diet may be relevant in certain contexts for certain people, but it cannot be generalized and uh, applied to the whole population. We need to have a dynamic approach uh, considering these individual factors. And if we were to conclude to say what is the type of diet that Ayurveda recommends, and I would say it is a flexitarian diet. Be as vegetarian, even vegan, as much as possible, but always be careful looking at your nutritional requirements using these eight factors. And if you really need to have some supplementation, then be open to it. So. Vegetarian, flexi-vegetarian, and a person-centered approach. This is, in a nutshell, the Ayurvedic approach to vegetarian nutrition. So thank you very much for your attention.